Mm -hmm. Okay, and so uh, good morning and good evening, and welcome back to the CFPR seminar series. And uh, um, so uh, my name is Jing Mu, and uh, I'm an assistant professor of sociology at NUS and also a member of the steering committee of CFPR. And uh, it's a pity that uh, PUC is still under weather today. So I will uh, chair today's uh, session on her behalf. And so today, uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's my honor to introduce our today's speaker, uh, Professor Susan Brown. And Professor Brown is distinguished professor of sociology at the Bowling Green State University. So she is a director of the Center for Family and Demographic Research and also co-director of the National Center for Family and Marriage Research. And she is also vice president of the Population Association of America. And now I believe she must be very busy organizing mm -hmm. uh, this coming uh, PAA uh, annual conference, which is um, probably the most important conference uh, as uh, for all the family demographers. And so um, as a, a family demographer herself, Professor Brown, uh, like uh, her research centers around uh, uh, several important issues uh, revolving around the uh, union dynamics and their consequences for health and well-being. And so uh, without further ado, let's welcome uh, Professor Brown to talk about uh, centering singlehood in family research. And so uh, following a CFPR convention, uh, like Professor Brown will uh, give a talk about 40 minutes and then followed up by a Q&A session. And uh, the participants uh, may notice that today the uh, setup of the meeting room is a little bit different and uh, it's a pity that I cannot see your faces now, <laughs> uh, but feel free to uh, type uh, your questions um, in the chat box along along with the uh, presentation, or you can also hold your questions by raising hand uh, during the Q&A session. And so Professor Brown, please. All right, well, thank you so much. It's really my pleasure to be here. I appreciate the kind introduction and I wanna thank Puck for inviting me uh, to share some of my uh, research with you and to discuss today um, this idea of how we can begin to center singlehood in family research. So hopefully you can see my slide up here, the title slide. Great, and I will get started. Okay, so as probably many of you know, singlehood is gaining ground. More and more people around the world are single. But even as the share of adults who are single has grown in recent decades, Family scholarship has largely ignored singlehood, focusing instead on intimate romantic relationships, namely marriage and cohabitation, of course. And even when singlehood is the subject of study, it's often framed in terms of changing patterns of marriage. And I think this emphasis is reflective of the persistent focus that we have as family scholars on couplehood. So this, Entrenched focus also belies the fact that marriage is declining. Family scholars have tracked the retreat from marriage in the US, Europe, Asia, and elsewhere. And the bottom line is that adults are spending less time than ever before in the married state, whether that's indicated by rising ages at first marriage, high divorce rates, or plummeting rates of remarriage. And together, these trends are really constant with the notion that marriage is no longer the defining feature of family life, but instead is just one of an array of options. Now, you might ask, what about cohabitation? And we know that the decline in marriage uh, throughout much of the world has coincided with growing levels of cohabitation, but this increase does not offset the decline that we've seen in marriage. If we look at the United States, for example, most unmarried adults, both in the US and elsewhere are not cohabiting. So in the US, just 10% of adults are cohabiting and that's compared with 40%, two out of five US adults who are neither married nor cohabiting. Um, so we've got 40% of US adults who are not cohabiting, not married yet, I would argue this is a group 
despite its size that remains largely invisible in contemporary family research. So my message is that we need to widen our lens to encompass more than just marriage and cohabitation um, to incorporate singlehood. And by framing singlehood in terms of changing marriage patterns, and I will admit, I just did that myself, I think that we run the risk of obscuring the lived experiences of singles. So family research persistently focuses on couplehood. It's emphasizing transitions into and out of co-residential unions. That's a lot of what we do, especially in family demography. But this approach implicitly reifies and privileges couple relationships, diminishing the significance of being single, potentially. And at the same time, it effectively means that we're treating singlehood as the residual or the reference category, which in turn suggests that singles are a monolithic group. And compared to the burgeoning huge literature on marriage and cohabitation, the relative dearth of scholarly attention to singlehood seems like a glaring omission in the literature. So I think centering singlehood in family research is long overdue. And what I'd like to do for a few minutes here is highlight for you a few statistics about singlehood. And then I'm gonna to turn to some ongoing theoretical and empirical developments in this area before I conclude with a call to action for family researchers to build a singlehood agenda. So at BGSU's National Center for Family and Marriage Research, we've spent the past couple of years flipping our script, if you will, trying to stop thinking so much about marriage and cohabitation to actually track trends in singlehood. And what you can see in this chart, um, this chart is showing you the share of the US population that is unmarried over the past century. And that's that top brown line there. The middle orange line is the trend in the percent never married. And the bottom blue line tells you uh, the percent that's previously married. So you can see that in 1960, that was the low point for being unmarried during the past 100 years in the US, which makes sense given the fact that the 1950s were the era of early and nearly universal marriage. So in 1960, just 28% of Americans were unmarried. And by comparison, we see that essentially half, 49% of US adults are unmarried today. Now note that this figure includes adults who are cohabiting because cohabitors are unmarried. And if we take out um, cohabitors, we would get to that roughly 40% of US adults who are unmarried and not cohabiting that I mentioned a moment ago. Um, we also should note that most unmarried adults in the United States are actually never married, not previously married. And the gap between these two groups appears to be widening in recent years, such that the share of adults who are never married in the United States is continuing to climb, even as the share that are previously married is essentially stalled out here and perhaps ebbing downward just a bit. So this graph shows you the trends in unmarried adults according to age group. And let me just note first and foremost, we're seeing that for all age groups, the percentage of the population that is unmarried is on the rise in the United States. Take young adults who are 18 to 29, for example. This is shown in the top blue line. The vast majority of them, 84%, are unmarried. But even if we look at those who are 30 to 39 years old, about half of them are currently unmarried um, at 46%, uh, percent, which is the, the orange line there. And even for those who are in their 40s and beyond, uh, we're approaching um, 40%, two and five who are unmarried today in the United States. So these are big groups of people. A different way to visualize um, the shifting age composition of unmarried adults is to examine the age distribution of the unmarried population. And this figure illustrates the declining share of unmarrieds who are young adults. That's that teal group you're seeing there at the bottom. In contrast, take a look at the yellow gold top area, which is widening, meaning that the growing share of unmarried adults age uh, 60 or older is on the increase. 
We can also see that larger shares of unmarrieds are in their 40s and their 50s. So even though we do a lot of hand wringing about young people never getting not getting married or delaying marriage, in fact, the unmarried population in the United States is an aging population. Now, acknowledging that unmarried adults who are cohabiting, we, we might not wanna uh, define them as single. Um, we also took a look at the estimates of the shares of single adults in the United States um, separately for women and men. So this, this graph is showing you marital status distributions of women and men who are not married and not cohabiting. So we've parsed out those cohabitors you can already tell our definition of who's single and who isn't is a little fuzzy. And I'm going to, that's just some foreshadowing for what's going to come later in the talk. What do we do with these cohabitors? They're unmarried, but they're really not single. So you'll, if you're paying close attention, you'll see my previous slides use the label unmarried. Now I'm using the label single here. Um, but again, as we mentioned previously, 40% of U.S. adults are single. If we use this definition of you're not married, you're not cohabiting. And more than half of single adults are never married. In the US context, most previously married adults are divorced. They're not widowed. Um, although as you would expect, uh, women are more often widowed than our men. Taking a look at singles by age group, we find that they're most prevalent at earlier and later stages of the adult life course. For adults who are in midlife, being single is relatively speaking less common. However, even among those who are 40 to 49 year olds, nearly one in three of them are single, again, meaning they are neither married nor cohabiting. So singlehood is a common experience across the adult life course. Setting aside cohabitation, um, here's what marital status looks like in Singapore and the United States. You can see that marriage is more widespread in Singapore than it is in the United States, with about 62% of adults in Singapore who are currently married versus 49% in the, in the US. Among the unmarried, um, you can see that the never married is the largest group in both countries, hovering close to or around one third of the total adult population. For the previously married, in Singapore, the shares who are divorced and widowed are essentially the same at close to 5% apiece. But in the United States, the picture is a little different where we see that the share divorced is almost twice as high as the share that are widowed. We're talking about a 11% versus just under 6%. Of course, we want to keep in mind that these levels not only ever reflect patterns of marital dissolution, but also exits out of that um, state into remarriage, which could um, differ between the two countries. So the demographic trends that I've just reviewed, I think make clear that singlehood is commonplace nowadays. And I think it's safe to say that singlehood is likely to become even more widespread as marriage continues its downward descent. So as marriage recedes, and cohabitation is, you know, it's not particularly rising in the US. We actually have some evidence that it's starting to plateau. Um, you know, I think this, this overlooking of, of singlehood, the lack of scholarly attention to singlehood in the, in, in the US and elsewhere around the globe is really no longer tenable. So the question becomes, how do we reorient the field of family research to address the topic of singlehood? And I think this is a harder task than it may seem. It's actually kind of deceptively simple. Capturing singlehood, whether we want to do that empirically, conceptually, or theoretically, defies a straightforward solution. So, you know, just by comparison, I think we could agree marriage is uh, pretty simple and straightforward to define and measure, and individuals either legally married or they're not. Even defining cohabitation. Is, is relatively straightforward. Uh, we could quibble around the edges there, but what constitutes singlehood? I mean, certainly we would say being unmarried is an element. You, you've got to be, uh, from a legal standpoint, be unmarried, be single. And I, you know, presumably individuals who are cohabiting would be excluded from the single population. 
But what about individuals who have non-co-resident partners? Are we going to call them single or are they something else? I think that these nuances underscore the heterogeneity of the single population. And I've just tried to highlight some of the dimensions of heterogeneity here on this slide. Uh, certainly some singles are living alone. Others are living with relatives or non-relatives. Many single adults are parents or have other caretaking responsibilities. Single adults are diverse in terms of their sexual and gender identities. They can be young, old, or somewhere in between. They may be never married or previously married. Um, some people are single by choice, whereas others are single by constraint. Being single at one point in time does not preclude being partnered at a different point in time and vice versa. In short, singles are not a monolithic group and the heterogeneity of singlehood is really multifaceted and it's also potentially significant in terms of how one experiences being single, going back to this concept of, of the lived experience of singlehood. So to stimulate new research on the topic of singlehood, the field requires some careful, thoughtful theory development. And so with colleagues, Aaron Lavender Stott, Karen Benjamin Guzzo, and Wendy Manning, uh, we issued a call for papers at the Journal of Family Theory and Review a year ago on the theme of theorizing singlehood with an aim to propel the field by generating novel insights on what we're calling kaleidoscopic approaches to conceptualizing singlehood. And we were really delighted to receive numerous strong submissions that rigorously grappled with how to unpack the complexities inherent in singlehood. And we also invited three scholars who are working on the cutting edge of this budding area to contribute pieces that we believe will be foundational as this research area blossoms. So the special issue of JFTR, which is gonna be published next month and almost all the articles are already available online first, uh, the special issue includes 13 articles that together offer scholars a roadmap that we hope will spur the field um, and get people initiating their own research on singlehood. So we're reviewing these articles as sort of navigational touchstones that offer guideposts for scholars as they traverse this territory that still unfortunately remains largely on the periphery of family research. So the articles in the special issue cluster around four key themes. We have invited pieces that provide foundational work on singlehood, articles on how to conceptualize singlehood, papers that interrogate singlehood pathways, and pieces on singlehood across various stages of the adult life course. So let me delve into each one in turn. So the first section features three invited pieces that together provide a strong foundation for the development of theoretical and empirical research on singlehood. And they call attention to the flaws that are inherent in impro approaching singlehood through the traditional lens of marriage and cohabitation, which arguably runs the risk of contributing to singleism, which is the term for the stigma that results from being marginalized as a single person. So these authors are arguing that we need to move away from the deficit perspective that can result from our continued emphasis on marriage and instead consider ways in which the single population is flourishing, recognizing that many single adults want to be single and they're happy being single. So we need to study the strengths and the benefits of singlehood. And in keeping with the notion that singles are a heterogeneous group, it's important to challenge the binary of singlehood and recognize that singlehood intersects with other dimensions, including gender and sexuality, race and ethnicity, age and social class, for starters. Conceptualizing singlehood is a central task. Um, and this is the second section of papers in the issue. And we may, we may think that defining who's single seems straightforward, but really upon closer inspection, it becomes evident that singlehood can be defined in many different ways. And there's no one right way, so to speak, to define and measure singlehood. 
So one of the articles that's in this section calls into question the prevailing approach to singlehood, which is predicated on um, the notion that singlehood is first marked by the absence of a partner and two, second, a temporary path to couplehood. And treating singlehood as a binary and assuming that um, singles are available and interested in forming a romantic partnership really denies the life trajectories of a growing number of singles, including those who choose not to form intimate partnerships. So we need to be gauging one's openness to and desire to forming a partnership when we conceptualize singlehood. So in particular, we need to consider permanent singlehood because many singles may be uninterested in romantic coupling. In another paper, authors critique social surveys that are couple-centric um, as evidenced by, for example, the collection of romantic history data. This is very common in demographic data sets that we use. Um, again, the lived experiences of singles tell us that many people prefer solo living. And these same authors even posit that there could be some utility in conceiving of singlehood, not just as beyond a binary, but actually something along a continuum. So we would have gradations of singlehood. And they note that some people who others might define as single may not view themselves as such. And I think this raises still more questions about how singlehood should be conceptualized and defined. And it again points to the potential value of self-definition as a single person versus the researcher imposing a uniform definition. Now, the third section of the special issue focuses on pathways to singlehood and intersects with the question of whether and for whom singlehood is due to choice or circumstance. So whether singlehood is voluntary or involuntary is a common theme in studies of singlehood. Um, voluntary singlehood, of course, indicates that people choose singlehood, they want to remain marriage free, and um, potentially they're single at heart. That's a term that's invoked by one of the papers in the special issue. Um, conversely, involuntary singles desire to change their relationship status and enter into a romantic relationship. Now, two of the papers in this section engage with the pathways perspective around social change um, within specific national contexts. So one paper traces the rise of the childless single in South Korea, pointing to cultural and economic shifts that have reshaped family formation behaviors there. Um, marriage is increasingly the province of a highly advantaged and selective group with those who are priced out of marriage constituting much of this childless single group that the authors um, detail, reflecting both the rarity of non-marital childbearing and um, the rarity of cohabitation in this context. And I think it's notable that South Korea has the lowest birth rate in the world. Um, another paper focuses on the growing number of never married adults in Japan and argues that rapid social change may actually be creating a vacuum of sorts in terms of the norms to guide people. And um, the author argues that singlehood may actually be less voluntary in this context than many would think and concludes that research needs to not only centerhood, center singlehood experiences, but also um, that researchers need to develop theories that are applicable in non-Western societies. The last session, uh, section of the special issue addresses singlehood at various stages of the adult life course. And these papers call attention to how singlehood, whether it be in terms of its prevalence, its meaning, or its linkages to other behaviors and outcomes, varies across the life course. So I think this framing reveals to us the potential pitfalls of conceptualizing singles as a group, as opposed to thinking about um, singlehood as a period of life, for example. So for young adults, singlehood may be both more normative, but also more transitory um, than it would be at other ages and stages of life. And this can make defining singlehood during young adulthood a bit difficult because many who might be considered by others or even define themselves as single, nonetheless are involved in romantic or sexual relationships. So here again, 
um, romantic interest or disinterest is really pivotal in shaping how singlehood is experienced and it complicates the dichotomies of voluntary versus involuntary singlehood or singlehood as either a transitory or a permanent state. Meanwhile, um, looking at the other end of the life course at the older adult population, which is growing rapidly in the US and in many other countries, reflecting uh, global aging, um, some of these older adults who are single have, been, have never been married, they're lifelong singles, but the majority of them are actually re-entering singlehood after a long period of partnership. Um, the rise in gray divorce, which is a term that's used to talk about divorce to adults generally over the age of 50, has changed the composition of unmarried older adults. And we know that this is a phenomenon that's evident not just in the United States, but also in Europe and Asia as they're seeing growth in divorce among older adults too. And most older adults who get divorced don't go on to repartner through cohabitation or remarriage. Instead, many of them are opting to form living apart together or lat relationships that afford flexibility and autonomy in the context of a committed relationship. And we know this relationship is, is gaining ground, but outside of Europe, it really hasn't been studied that much. So it raises a question though about whether older adults um, in lat relationships are single. Should we call them single or not? And I think this is an important question for um, future research to delve into. So these are just a few highlights from our special issue. As I said, it will be um, published next month and I encourage you to check it out. I'm optimistic that it will be um, uh, worthwhile and I hope that it stimulates some new uh, research on singlehood. But I'd like to segue now to some of my own ongoing research on singlehood, which focuses on midlife adults. And we define uh, midlife as adults who are aged 30 to 50. And this is a group that I would argue has been largely overlooked in family research. Um, we tend to focus on children, adolescents, and young adults, or we're focused on the other end of the life course, older adults. And by comparison, midlife adults have received relatively little attention. And in the United States, at least, I think this reflects um, data constraints. You know, we collect data on young people through various cohort studies, and then we have data sets like the health and retirement study to investigate older adulthood, but we're lacking the modern equivalent of the 1987-88 National Survey of Families and Households um, that allowed us to look at family dynamics across adults um, spanning the ages of 18 to 65. We have nothing like that right now in the United States. Um, so we know that various demographic trends are pointing to rising levels of singlehood in midlife. Um, we could point to the fact that um, marriage entry is being delayed until later ages in the United States. Um, cohabitation's no longer growing. It seems to have stalled out and plateaued. Gray divorce is climbing. Individuals are unlikely to repartner. All of these factors are setting the stage for a growing single population in midlife. A key factor is the rise in the share of midlife adults who have never gotten married. And this time trend um, illustrates that since 1970, the share of US adults aged 30 to 50 who'd never been married quadrupled from a mere 7% in 1970 to 29% today. Now, some of these um, never married midlife adults could be cohabiting. That's my little asterisk here for you. Um, but, you know, taking cohabitation into account is important. And you can see here about 10% of midlife adults are cohabiting and they do account for about one in four unmarried adults. But once we parse out the cohabitors, set them aside, we can see that 21% of midlife adults have never been married and are not cohabiting. And another 9% are separated or divorced and not cohabiting. And less than 1% is currently widowed. So earlier this year, uh, my colleagues, Wendy Manning and Karen Guzzo and I fielded an online survey of 801 
US midlife adults. And to be part of the sample, respondents had to be unmarried and not cohabiting. We contracted with the Ohio State University to collect the data using their American Population Panel, which is an ongoing online national panel. And we're currently cleaning and preparing this data set, which we've tentatively titled Singlehood in America, uh, for a planned uh, public release in 2024 through ICPSR at the University of Michigan. So this survey covers a range of topics, uh, some of which I've um, noted here. We ask the standard demographic questions and obtain information on the respondent's family of origin, including parents and siblings. We also obtain detailed data on their prior marital and cohabitation experiences and ascertain their expectations for marriage and cohabitation in the future. Um, we query respondents about romantic and sexual relationships and ascertain the quality of those relationships. Another segment of the survey is devoted to parenthood and fertility behaviors since about half of single midlife adults are parents. And we tap into friendship dynamics because most midlife singles, as I'll show you in a minute, are not in a current romantic relationship. And we gauge um, the sources of social support that midlife singles um, have, as well as their health and well being. And our survey also contains attitudinal items about how respondents have experienced singlehood. So we try to tap into perceived instances of discrimination that they may have experienced as a single person. And we also ask respondents to report on how they feel about being single. So what they like about it, what they don't like about it. And these items are designed to really get at whether um, individuals are single due to choice or constraint and to help illuminate possible benefits of singlehood that we derive from the lived experience of singles themselves. So this survey really covers a lot of ground. Um, and what I'd like to do uh, now is just show you a few very preliminary results. We're still in the early stages of, of uh, sifting through the, the data. So um, in our singlehood survey, we ask respondents whether they're currently in a romantic relationship. And that's how the question is phrased. Are you currently in a romantic relationship? And you can see in the bottom row here that just 9% of midlife singles say that they are. We're labeling this shorthand here with, with dating, but the question is, are you in a romantic relationship? And we thought this level seemed a little bit low, but of course we don't really have a good benchmark to use to gauge the accuracy of this estimate. So we decided to turn to other data sets to see what we could cobble together to you know, uh, figure out what the, the um, range might be here. And you, you can see that the estimates um, we brought together a, a bit wide ranging. Um, and I, I think this really uh, reinforces the larger point that we lack robust data on midlife US adults. So the closest estimate that we found comes from ad health data. That's encouraging. It's a large national uh, cohort study. Um, we got 11% there from that are dating in the ad health. The age range is not quite the same about, as ours, but is a subset of it. Um, but estimates that um, we got from another online panel survey that we collected in 2013, the FRS, Families and Relationships Study, that yielded a much higher estimate of 27%. And 27 to 30% was the modal estimate that we obtained using NSFG data along with the Toledo Adolescent Relationship Studies, the TARS data, uh, which is an ongoing um, cohort study as well conducted by some of our colleagues. So it's true that variation in question wording, um, differences in the ages of the sample could be part of the story here, but nonetheless, I think it's telling that we're getting such a wide range of estimates. All right, so we decided to take a closer look at the midlife singles who are dating, that 9% in our survey, and compare them with the vast majority of midlife singles who are not in a romantic relationship. And we'll start here with men. You can see here that most midlife single men do have prior union experience, and that's true regardless of their dating status. So daters and non-daters are similarly likely to have been previously married at 55% and 53% respectively. 
almost all men who are in a dating relationship right now have previously cohabited, 96%, but cohabitation is less common among non-dating men at just 59%. And more than half of all men currently in a romantic relationship have previously cohabited and been previously married. And that's in comparison to just one third of men not currently in a relationship. So I think these patterns suggest to us that there could be some selection into dating relationships. Men who are dating um, in midlife more often have prior union experience. For women, a different pattern emerges. Those who are currently dating are unlikely to have been married before. You can see just 31% whereas more than half of women who are not in a romantic relationship right now have been married before. So it appears that midlife single women are unlikely to be dating given that they have prior marital experience. And that's a departure from the pattern that we observe for men. So most women who are dating, they have cohabited uh, previously, but that's also true for most women who aren't dating. Um, they've co most women who, are, who aren't dating have also um, cohabited previously. Um, unlike men, less than half of dating women have both prior marital and cohabiting experience. And I'd note that the gap between dating and non-dating women on this dimension is, is smaller too. So in line with the notion of voluntary versus involuntary singlehood, we asked respondents about their desires to marry and cohabit. And to the best of our knowledge, the field has not uncovered whether midlife single adults even want to get married or live with someone or if they prefer to stay single. So this slide illustrates for us what men have to say about this. And we show these results separately for those who are dating, who are in the current romantic relationship versus those who aren't in a relationship. And you can see here that very few single men want to get married someday, at best 31, percent do uh, who are currently in a relationship. Um, and this this is true for both groups, right? Because even fewer who aren't in a relationship want to get married, less than one in five, 17%. Rather, what we're seeing here is that the preferred outcome appears to be cohabitation without marriage. More than one third of men want to cohabit. Not far behind that top category, though, is the sizable share of single men who are not interested in either marriage or cohabitation. So we've got more than one in four men who don't want to form a union. Turning to women now, we can see that women are a bit more interested in marriage than men are, but still most midlife single women do not wanna get married someday. So 43% of those who are dating say they wanna get married, but only 21% of those who are not in a relationship say that they want to marry. And this is marry anyone. It's not about marrying the person you're in the relationship. It just means you wanna marry in the future. And much like we see for men, cohabitation seems to be the preferred arrangement for women. We've got 40% of women in a romantic relationship uh, wanting to cohabit in the future. And among women who are not in a relationship, just 26% want to cohabit. And that's nearly the same level that express a lack of interest in neither getting married nor cohabiting. So um, it's also interesting here for women uh, in particular to note that there's a fair amount of uncertainty about union experiences. And that's especially evident among non-dating women where we see that more than a quarter of them are unsure about whether they want to get married or live with a partner. We asked those not currently in a romantic relationship to tell us why they weren't in a relationship right now. So this is, you know, setting aside the 9% in the romantic relationship, we're looking at the 91% uh, who are not in a relationship at the time of interview. And we gave them four possible um, explanations to choose from, or we allowed them to indicate that there was some other reason. And more than 90% of respondents picked one of these four um, reasons that we provided and show on the slide. So you can see that responses do differ by gender. Um, men tend to say that they aren't dating because they don't have time for it, although close behind that is a lack of interest in dating. And among women, not being interested in dating is the most common response with not having met someone who's worth dating coming in a close second. So I think it's noteworthy that nearly one in three 
single midlife adult reports they're not interested in forming a romantic relationship. And I think this goes back to this notion of choice versus constraint. And the message here is that for many singles, dating is simply not appealing. So I hope that this presentation has prompted you to think in new ways about the significance of singlehood in family research. And I'd like to conclude with a call to action to move singlehood from the margins of family scholarship into the mainstream. To decipher the meaning and significance of singlehood, I think we can start to interrogate singlehood as a family form of sorts. And this is something the co-guest editors and I batted around is singlehood a family form? It's an interesting um, academic question, if nothing else. I think this really involves giving careful consideration to how we define and conceptualize singlehood. So where do partners and romantic relationships fit into the equation, for instance? We know that singles may do family in distinctive ways relying more heavily on friends, extended family, or other network ties. So what do these constellations of support look like? And rather than thinking um, from the child's perspective, as we typically do as family scholars about growing up with a single parent, let's flip it and say, what does parenthood and caregiving look like for single adults? So this kind of example leads me directly um, to the next point here, which is that we're gonna to need to move beyond our standard marriage or couple-centric theories and approaches that can't always be readily adapted or retrofitted for single adults. So I think centering singlehood means developing new theories and frameworks that transcend our conventional approaches to thinking about families. So in terms of next steps for the field, first and foremost, we need to flesh out our conceptualizations of singlehood to reflect the nuances and the heterogeneity of the single population. So in other words, we would benefit from bringing in the lived experiences of singles themselves to inform our development of measures of singlehood. And then we need to develop measures that operationalize our conceptions of singlehood to test and refine our concepts and measures, new data collections that begin to center singlehood or at least not treat singles as the reference or residual category are going to be necessary. So we see our Singlehood in America data collection as a notable first step in this regard. I think that our data set offers a fairly detailed look at the lives of midlife singles and it provides a foundation for us to build on to study singlehood across the adult life course. So going forward um, and thinking longer term, longitudinal studies that capture the dynamics of singlehood will really help us to advance this nascent area of family research. So I thank you for the opportunity to share my uh, scholarship with you today and look forward to taking your questions and feedback. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Brown. I think we already have a question uh, in the Q&A. And so let me allow uh, Vincent to speak uh, directly. And then for others, if you have a question, uh, please raise hand and then we'll uh, allow you to speak. Vincent, do you want to ask a question directly to Professor Brown? Hi. Hey, yeah, we can hear you. Hi, 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 Prof Brown, can you hear me? Yes, hi, hi. Hi, hi, yeah. Actually, I typed the question in the chat box. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'll just ask it uh, now. Um, so single singlehood rates are going up. Um, but is this due to cultural, a uh, larger cultural shift? Or is it really a social um, structural sort of reason that's driving this? Uh, anything from inflation to uh, difficult labor market? 
uh, even to things like, you know, one of the slides says, um, I, I want to, but I don't have the time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is it, is it um, this, this rise of singlehood, is, is it due to a larger cultural shift or is it really a social structural sort of uh, factors that are driving it? Or perhaps it's even both, you know, uh, working at the same time. Uh, does the data tell in any way uh, what the drivers are? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I think that's um, you know, sort of the the million dollar question. You've you've hit the nail on the head there with your your question. So thank you. Um, and you know, I I guess the way that, in my view, the way that family scholars have approached this question is really through the lens of marriage once again, and saying why is it that Americans or um, South Koreans or Europeans or whatever group might be, because this is happening all around the world, why aren't young people getting married anymore? Or why aren't they having children anymore, right? And we're not asking the question of why are they staying single so long? And we could say that that sounds like a subtle difference, but I, I think it's not because again, it's sort of just shunting, shunting anyone who doesn't follow the normative path to the side and also acting like they're all of the same ilk and it's a monolithic group. And so is it that more people view singlehood as desirable? We can't even really get to that um, answer as a possibility when we continue to have the lens be on why don't they get married? And so as I'm sure you know, there's tons of literature about why young people don't get married today, ranging from uh, that marriage is increasingly a capstone experience and you have to accomplish um, all of these different uh, important life transitions, such as uh, getting your education and getting a real job and being able to afford a, a house and paying down your debt. And that's a really tall order for more and more young people these days. But that doesn't directly address are there unique features or benefits or advantages of being single that may be attracting people away from marriage or attracting people away from cohabitation. And I think like the, the lat relationship status is a good illustration here, because if we think about, you know, marriage as universal historically, and then increasingly in certain contexts, cohabitation has gained acceptance. And the argument was, well, marriage is just a piece of paper. You can get many of the benefits of marriage without actually getting married and you can just cohabit. Now you have people saying, well, I don't even need to live with my partner. I can maintain my autonomy, my independence, but I can still have a committed relationship that's not going to culminate in either cohabitation or marriage. But we just really don't even talk about that that much. Like there's just so little on non-marital, non-co-residential relationships in the literature. That's why I think like the fact that we couldn't, you know, we don't have a good sense of, well, if you make it to age 30, 35, 40, and you haven't gotten married yet, do you even want to get married? Do you want to cohabit? Those would seem like really basic questions, especially given the demographic context of how many people are single, yet we just don't seem to be asking those. And so I, you know, I, I think Certainly, we have a few people, especially in our um, invited ish pieces in the special issue. Um, we have some scholars that are really um, arguing strongly that the way we approach our research doesn't allow for the visibility of the benefits of singlehood. And so, you know, I think that there probably are real ways in which um, many people, whether it be young people or even older people, because they're not getting remarried, even older people are seeing um, unique advantages to being single. And I think we just, and they're likely to span both culture, the cultural realm and the economic realm. Um, but I, I think we really, we need to try to unpack that explicitly rather than always sort of going through um, the, the marriage uh, track and thinking of it from that couple centric standpoint. So thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Mujin. Okay. Thank you, Vincent. Um, 
Any other questions, uh, please uh, raise your hands. Or uh, you can just uh, type in uh, either Q&A uh, box or the chat box. Um, uh, may I ask yeah, questions? Yeah, book, yeah. Um, Susan, thank you so much. I really enjoy your presentation and you know the sort of uh, introduction to the special issues. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on the single hood study? Um, do you find any sort of uh, patterns by um, socioeconomic status among those who are dating or not dating? And uh, is it uh, specific to particular, um, you know, socioeconomic uh, group or um, uh, race and ethnicity uh, in, in the U.S.? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, and, you know, whether it be from our study on the midlife singles or even just thinking about other research on um, singles and daters, I mean, I I just, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to think of something here. We haven't looked at it in our own data yet. I haven't gotten that far. It really is hot off the press is what I'm showing you. Um, I mean, I know for older adults and I, I uh, did a study on this that was in JMF about a decade ago that for older singles who are dating, they are much more advantaged than their non-dating counterparts. Um, they have more economic resources, they are better educated, they have fewer health problems. And I think that's not so surprising, but would that be true for younger people and middle-aged people? I don't know. I mean, there's some literature that shows individuals who um, experience disabilities are much less likely to get married uh, than their counterparts who don't. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's something that's still very much um, wide open and is um, uh, urgently needs to be studied. So that's a, that's a great question. Uh, actually, I want to ask a, a follow-up question, uh, like uh, with a uh, Puck's question, and so, uh, like regarding the socioeconomic gradients of uh, singlehood. So, actually, I think in a way, I'm trying to like uh, relate uh, to the literature on cohabitation. So, it mm -hmm. uh, used to be uh, how cohabitation used to be a relatively uh, uh, avant-garde. Uh, uh, like a behavior, right? And so happening more likely among uh, the highly educated, but now recently, like uh, due to this uh, socioeconomic uh, like pressures and the precarity in uh, economy and so on, it could also become like a, a poor, poor man's marriage. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it seemed that in this picture that uh, like different uh, socioeconomic groups uh, may perceive uh, like a singlehood in a way, also differently. And that perception may change over time. So probably in like a, like a 10, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, it is uh, probably like a still uh, like more uh, uh, prevalent among the lower educated, but nowadays uh, given that singlehood also requires like more economic independence, autonomy, right? And also like more individualistic and uh, uh, in a way more cosmopolitan views about uh, life choices is more more prevalent uh, among the better educated. I, I don't know, this is just like a, in a way a hypothesis. And so I want to hear about your thought about uh, the like temporal change uh, of the uh, SES gradients in singlehood. And also secondly, uh, regarding the gender differences, I find it's quite interesting. Uh, the two uh, uh, figures you show uh, about uh, men's and women's union expectations, it seems that in a way, like a men's uh, preferences tend to be uh, like a clearer in a way, right? There's like a, this uh, two uh, like a, a more popular uh, categories, uh, but for women, it seems that uh, like it is quite evenly distributed among the four categories. It's like a relatively ambivalent, and so uh, mm -hmm. probably indicating that women, in a way, are are more diverse uh, in their uh, expectations for a romantic or intimate relationships. Uh, so um, I, I would want to like uh, hear more about the potential uh, mechanisms uh, behind the gender gender gaps. Yeah, thank you. Great. Okay. So let me start with your question mm. about um, the socioeconomic gradient in mm. singlehood. And I think, you know, that's something that 
surprisingly, yeah, or not, you know, I don't think we yeah. know too much about that because again, we look a lot from the perspective of, oh, well, marriage is, there's a strong um, gradient for marriage. And then on cohabitation in the US, mm -hmm. it's um, led by the less educated, although the gap has been closing, but it's still cohabitation is, is least common among the college educated, mm -hmm. whereas in Europe, it's the reverse and it's the more highly educated are more likely to cohabit. Um, we, I did have a slide that I just, you know, I had to cut some of my slides to try to keep my, in the time frame. but I did, um, take a look at the levels of singlehood across, um, six different education categories in the United States. And certainly it's the case that at lower levels of education, there are higher levels of singlehood and the gaps are not huge but they are notable and even you know just even the difference between you know college educated is higher than those with a graduate degree mm -hmm. for instance in terms of singlehood and we do see in the US context um significant variation across racial and ethnic groups um with asian americans least likely to be single followed by whites and then uh, Blacks and Latinos are more likely to be single and, and particularly high levels for um, Black Americans. So yeah, I think those are, those are key questions that we need to um, delve into to think about what are the resources. And then likewise, you know, the resources are, are going to tie into living arrangements. And I have some work um, ongoing with one of our grad students about the living arrangements of midlife singles, and they're very different by gender. So the vast majority of midlife men are living alone, and the vast majority of midlife women are living with a child or children. And um, so we've, you know, we've tried to illustrate sort of the um, disparities or, or differences in the living arrangements of these two groups. Um, so that that sort of goes to your second point about the the gender findings and why is so so your question is sort of why is it that women are like they they mentioned all four of these possible outcomes marriage cohabitation neither or they don't know versus men are a little bit more on the they just want to cohabit and they have some interest in marriage right mm -hmm. is that sort of your question yes yes yeah yeah, I, I think I think you know we're going to have to chew on it a little bit and try to think about it because especially for midlife adults, we just don't study them that much. And I, at least in in the U.S., I don't know. Maybe you know if you're familiar with work in other um, countries that talk about midlife um, singles, I'd be interested to hear about it because I feel like in the United States we talk so much about young people and why they aren't getting married and we pay attention to them until about age 40 and then we stop paying attention and we pick it back up again when they're you know well over 50 and they're moving into yeah. uh, later life and so what's going on with people in midlife I think it's just it's just really um, an understudied topic and then by extension it's actually under theorized so whether and under what conditions would we expect people to want to get married in um, midlife? Like how, how we know we've got, we've got these um, surveys that have been going on since the 1970s of high school seniors. So they're 17, 18 years old. And, you know, do you want to get married? Do you want to have a family, et cetera? And questions about other attitudes too, but gives a great time trend. And all these young people say they want to get married. But then we know that fewer and fewer are, um, and, and the levels who want to get married have dropped off a little bit, but really not that much. But then what about, you know, people who go through their 20s and even into their 30s? Do they want to, do they change their minds, right? Because these are these expectations to marry or cohabit are not static. And so what makes people change their minds? So that's sort of why we, you know, we're just beginning to delve into um, the findings from these items on the survey, but I think, you know, that's where the, we need theory too, as you're indicating, it's, you know, it's interesting to see the differences, but then how are we supposed to interpret them and make sense of them and contextualize them? And so I think we've got a lot of work ahead of us here on this front. <laughs> yeah, but it's exciting, uh, 
field, right, to explore. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. I think we have a, a question uh, from Hu Shu. Yeah. Hu Shu, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Brown. Um, I, I I have a comment and a question. So the comment is really to add to the discussion uh, just now about the social economic gradient uh, in singlehood. Um, I just want to add that, um, like in the in the context of Singapore, uh, when we look at the educational uh, gradient in terms of singlehood, um, there's a gender uh, pattern here. So mm -hmm. among highly educated men, singlehood rates is lower, but, but then it's the opposite pattern for, for women. So highly educated women um, have higher singlehood rates. Um, yeah, just a comment to the uh, discussion. Um, my question is related to the special issue you kindly introduced to us uh, mm -hmm. during um, since the special issue did include papers uh, uh, from South Korea and Japan, I'm just wondering because um, because I think singlehood, uh, depending on the decoupling between you know marriage and parenthood, um, it it means quite different things in different so, mm -hmm. uh, social contexts. Um, and the late um, demographer uh, Professor Gavin Jones in one of his articles about uh, effective singlehood in East Asian. Um, he was uh, comparing uh, with uh, European uh, context, for example. And basically, even though the, um, the singlehood rates might look similar in terms of the absolute level, but because of, um, because uh, th there's very low non-marital uh, childbearing parenthood mm -hmm. uh, in East Asia, I think that includes Singapore here, um, so, so, um, and and I think in the United States, in the context, uh, when you talk about a single uh, um, adults, uh, it, uh, I think a significant uh, proportion of them is actually single mothers, right, with children, and I think the social support and public policy implications are quite different. So for this special issue, I'm just curious, how did um, the editors approach um, this when? when you are trying to theorize singlehood across these very different um, social contexts and with, with different policies, public policies. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, thank you very much for your um, comment and, and feedback. And I, I hear your point and it's absolutely true that singlehood is gonna play out differently in various um, social contexts. And I think that you know, we've got a few different papers that talk about different contexts or um, from, you know, whether it be geographically different countries or that talk about um, different subgroups of singles. And so, yes, I think that it it really um, reinforces this idea that we've got a lot of work to do to try to think about the multiple meanings and implications of singlehood. And even within a particular context, um, as you're saying, like in the United States, we might see that a lot of singles have children, but of course a lot don't. And so if it's, you know, if half do and half don't, for example, then um, those are two very different groups potentially. Um, and maybe their expectations for marriage or cohabitation are going to differ, their willingness to have a partner. Um, and we've got a whole set of questions about um, if you're for, for parents in the survey, you know, would you is the fact that you're a parent that you have children? Is that something that's keeping you from forming a ro romantic relationship? Do you not want to? Um, have a relationship until your children are grown up, for example. Um, so, you know, our, the, but going back to the special issue, um, we were interested in, in um, receiving work from uh, scholars doing a variety of um, theory development and, and research on singles. So we, you know, we were very open to um, uh, considering papers that that address singlehood in in multiple different um, contexts. So I, th I think that 
what we have is, is a great start and hopefully it inspires more people to um, join us in, in trying to shift family research just a little bit to think about singles as singlehood becomes so um, common around the globe and also um, you know, an acknowledgement of the heterogeneity as you're, you're noting in, in terms of who, who composes the single population. Um, I think uh, it's about time and yeah, it's actually perfect timing. And so I guess uh, now let's uh, put our hands together virtually <laughs> and uh, to uh, thank uh, Professor Brown for this uh, exciting and uh, wonderful talk and introduce us to this uh, like a new field and looking forward to the development of this field and uh, the theories, um, new findings. And also thank you for everyone who joined us uh, uh, this early morning, of course, it's already late night for Professor Brown. And so uh, have a good day uh, or a good night and a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.